action. Good morning. I'm Dave Rowan. I'll be your instructor today for real estate contracts. Contracts are very important in your daily life, in your real estate practice, and PSI, the test administrator for your state exam, 17% of the questions deal with contracts. Today we're going to be doing a different form of teaching. We're using the Socratic method, that of questions and answers. To quote Professor Kingsley in the movie The Paper Chase, I'm going to spin the tumblers of your mind. Real estate contracts. <clears throat> Consideration. Consideration is the price paid. A legal act, a contract, must be for a legal act. If I ask Gene to go downstairs and beat up the security guy, that's an illegal act. It's not contractable. Agreement. According to the statute of frauds, to be enforceable, a contract must be in writing. Competent parties. All parties to a contract must possess legal capacity. Age of majority. Sound mind and free of intoxication. Promises mutually exchanged. Real estate contracts are bilateral. The buyer promises to buy, the seller promises to give the buyer good title to the property, free of liens and encumbrances. Legal tender. Money. Love and affection. It's consideration, but for purposes of your real estate exam, Consideration is the price paid. Price paid. Earnest money. You will hear from real estate licensees that you have to put down money when you sign a real estate contract. Earnest money is not an essential element of a contract. Consideration the price paid is. Earnest money is not. Legal purpose. A contract is for a legal purpose. During this course, there's post-it notes. If you have a question, please write it down. Stephanie will collect them and bring them up to me. We'll set up the whiteboard like a parking lot and get through every one of your questions. Legal purpose must not be against public policy. Discrimination. Not only is it against the law, it's immoral, it's against public policy. Competent parties, 
age of majority, mentally competent, free of intoxication. The olden days where people went out and they had a few drinks, made a deal, not anymore. Mutual consent. Mutual consent is also known as meeting of the mind, where two parties agree to the major points of a contract. Offer and acceptance. We're going to talk about that quite a bit today. Someone makes an offer. When someone else accepts it, there's a contract. We're also going to talk about breach of contract when someone breaks that promise without legal cause. Meeting of the minds. Meeting of the minds is mutual consent. Two parties agreeing to the major points of a contract. Reality of consent. Free of mistakes. A contract must be free of mistakes. Could be a small mistake. Somebody wrote down the wrong address. Could be a big mistake. Someone, and this happened to me, I was showing a two-family house. Ends up it was a one-family house. I caught it before the buyer went into contract and suffered a financial loss. Free of fraud. Lisa and I were talking about a transaction. Someone bought a house. There were scented oil plugins all over the house. Two weeks after the buyer bought, buyer could no longer live in the property. The former owner was a cat hoarder. When they called someone in to fumigate, he said, the only way you're getting rid of the odor is to bulldoze the house. The buyer sued, got his money back, sued the broker. Then they sold the house to someone else and didn't disclose it. He's suing for triple damages under consumer fraud which will be $3 million plus dollars. Now, we're going to talk about E&O insurance in a later chapter. That's the broker's liability. Most of them do not cover fraud. Misrepresentation. The two family, that was really a one family. It was probably misrepresentation. The, the agent should have known better, should have done her research, didn't. Undue influence happens in a close relationship. For instance, two sisters inherit a property, and one takes advantage of her sister because she knows she can. And duress is compelling someone through fear. The statute of frauds. Contracts have to be in writing to be enforceable under the statute of frauds.
The parole evidence rule states that written agreements supersede any oral promises or agreements. So if it's not in writing, someone's not entitled to it. And we were talking in one of the classes how agents do not put down in listing contracts, sales contracts, what's included and excluded. And there can be a problem later on. Don't be one of those people. Types of contracts. We start out with unilateral. Uni meaning what? One. An option is a unilateral contract. So is an inducement. If your broker has a policy that if you sell three homes in a month, you get a bonus, is the broker forcing you to sell three homes in a month? No. But if you do, does the broker have to give you a bonus? Yes. Unilateral. Bilateral. Promises are mutually exchanged. Real estate contracts are bilateral. The buyer promises to give money to the seller. The seller promises to give good title to the buyer. For a valid contract, competent parties, sound mind, age of majority, free of intoxication. Valuable consideration, and we said consideration is something of value for the purposes of your state exam. It's the price paid. Legal purpose. Again, a contract has to be for a legal purpose. Mutual consent, an agreement, by both parties to the major points of a contract. Good faith. Everyone acting in good faith. The buyer? doing everything they can to fulfill their promise, and the seller doing everything they can to fulfill their promise. Essentials of a valid contract. Void versus voidable. A void contract has no effect legally. A voidable contract could be made void by one of the parties, and a perfect example of that would be a contract between an adult and a minor. If the minor wants to buy, the adult has to sell. But if the minor changes their mind, the adult cannot compel them to go forward with the transaction. So what, what's considered a minor under 21? 18. Oh, 18. In New Jersey, it's 18. Okay. So the minor can disaffirm, the adult cannot.
Executed versus executory. A fully executed contract doesn't happen until the closing. When a buyer and a seller sign a contract, it's executory. That means things still have to be accomplished. It's fully executed when nothing is left to be completed. Express or implied. An express contract is clearly defined in writing, spells out the obligations of both parties. An implied contract is created by the actions of the party. I guess everyone knows that I'm from New Jersey because we're the last state that has gas station attendance. So when you pull up, the attendant fills your tank it's implied you're going to pay for the gas. When you go to a restaurant and you order food, it's implied you're going to pay for the food. Creation of a contract, offer, and acceptance. Typically, a buyer makes an offer to a seller. The seller can accept it or the seller can reject it. The other option is a counteroffer. But I want you all to understand a counteroffer is a rejection of the original offer. <clears throat> Here's an offer. You can see the list price is 100000 as it. The list price. The offer is 90000 and fix the roof. The seller counters, 110 and they'll fix the roof. The buyer counters, 100000 and fix the roof. The seller accepts, and now there's a contract. We in the real estate business always make errors in that we do not put a time frame for which an offer is to remain active. And that's all our fault. Here's an offer, happened to me. Went into a deli, saw delicious sandwich being advertised. With an upcoming Super Bowl party, I bought a sandwich. Super Bowl Sunday, I picked up the sandwich. When we took the top of the bread off, the sandwich was moldy. I accepted the deli's offer of the sandwich. There was an offer and acceptance. 
Therefore, the deli owner and I had a contract. Breach of contract. The deli owner breached the contract by giving me a moldy sandwich. And if I had asked an attorney, where am I going to get another sandwich one hour before game time? The deli owner blamed it on me. I know what happened. I assume what happened. They made the sandwich the night before and they didn't have refrigeration. They left it out and overnight it got moldy. Couldn't use it. Got my money back. Counter offers. Okay, a counter offer is a rejection of the original offer. Therefore, going back to our scenario, buyer makes an offer to a seller, seller rejects it and counters, the buyer does not have to respond. The altered offer is a counter offer, original offer is void. And as salespersons, you need to be aware that a counter offer terminates the original offer. Because the buyer doesn't even have to respond to that. They can just get up and walk away and that's it, it's over. So if a seller is going to make a counter offer, you have to tell them that by making this counter offer, you're terminating the original offer and therefore you might be killing the deal. Do you really want to do that? Do you really want to do that? If a counter offer is accepted, it becomes a binding contract. Revocation. The person making an offer can revoke their offer at any time prior to acceptance. Prior to acceptance. Okay. We have an offer, we have a, an offer from a buyer to a seller. We have a couple counter offers, and then we have an acceptance. Contract creation, termination of an offer. Acceptance becomes a contract. Rejection. Back to status quo. Revocation, the offer can be withdrawn anytime prior to acceptance. Expiration. We in the real estate industry should put 
a time frame for which an offer is to remain active. But we don't. When we sold our house in New York, buyer made us an offer, we countered, the buyer said, I accept your offer if you sign a contract before midnight tonight. He wanted a time frame. Counter off. Death or insanity of either party terminates an offer. A contract is a promise enforceable by law. If one of the parties without legal cause breaks the contract, they could be forced to pay damages to the injured party. Breach of contract. A breach of contract is when one of the parties without legal cause breaks their promise to the other party. And they can be forced to pay damages for that. Gives the other party the right to legal recourse. Legal recourse. A lawsuit, money damages. Sure, the contract can be rescinded. But one of the parties might have suffered a tremendous financial loss. If a seller decides, I'm not going to sell, and the buyer has done inspections, possibly given up a rental, legal fees, inspection fees, the damages can run into five figures. If a buyer default, A seller might have put a deposit on another property. And now they own two homes and they could be financially strapped. Damages can again be in the five figures. Forfeiture of deposit, that may not be enough. Suit for damages. Specific performance. A suit for specific performance is a lawsuit to make the defaulted party perform to the contract. Assignment and novation. An assignment is the transfer of a contract to a third party. A novation is a new contract created. We use novations many times with assumable mortgages to get the seller off the responsibility of the loan and put the buyer in their place. Some assignments 
We, we have situations where someone puts an offer on a property, and then they talk to their attorney and their accountant, and the accountant or attorney says, let your corporation buy the property. So they assign it to the corporation. That's usually not a problem. But when it's another person, that could be an issue. So an assignment passes some of the rights to a third party. A novation, the contract is terminated, and a new contract is created with the third party. Elements of a contract, essential elements. There has to be a property description. In a contract, an address, a lot and block, city, county, and since we only work in New Jersey, uh, we use a New Jersey contract. Meets and bounds as done by a surveyor in New Jersey is only done for mortgages and deeds. Meets and bounds is done by a surveyor and the survey is typically done after the buyer gets their loan commitment. Signature of the parties, full names of all owners, full names of all owners. What if the wife bought the property when she was single, then got married? The husband moved in. Does he have to sign? In New Jersey, yes, because he has, if it's the marital property, he has a right of possession. Just like if the husband bought the property when he was single, then got married, she moved in, she has right of possession in the property and would have to sign the listing contract, sales contract, and the deed. New Jersey has right of possession. Proof of person serving in a legal capacity. So important. Someone tells you, I have power of attorney over this person. Okay. My company requires should be your answer. My company requires us to have a copy of it. <clears throat> Same thing if someone were to tell you, I'm the executor. I'm the executrix of the estate. I have guardianship over this person. My company requires that I have a copy of it. A number of years ago, salesperson in my office, she was home, and a real estate agent knocks on her door. We finally sold your mother's house. So she's dumbfounded. She says, uh, I don't want to sell my mother's house. I'm happy collecting a nice rent check every month. He said, well, we've been working over a year trying to sell your mother's house. Her response was, I never authorized you to sell my mother's house. Well, your sister did. 
she said, my sister and I are co-executrix of the estate. I did not authorize you to sell my mother's house. I'm not selling my mother's house. Get off my property. So this agent worked for a year to sell this house, finally got a buyer, and got nothing. Because she wouldn't sell. She didn't want to sell. The agent really erred by not asking the other sister for the letters of testamentary. When someone dies, the executor or executrix probates the will at the county surrogate's office. When the county surrogate determines the will is valid, letters of testamentary are issued to the executor or executrix. In this case, both sisters were on the letters of testamentary that they were both co-executrix. The agent never asked for that paperwork and therefore worked a year for nothing. Didn't have the correct proof of who was legally authorized to sell the property. Options, written contract. In your real estate career, you will deal with options in two different ways. One, a rent with options. Or, when you're dealing with a developer, developers today are not going out, buying a huge piece of land, subdividing it, and then hoping they can build whatever they want to build. They're entering into an option agreement with the seller. An option is a written contract supported by consideration. Money has to be paid for that option. In the case of a developer, 10%, maybe 20% is offered to the seller. If the buyer buys, seller gets the uh, credits the purchase price. If the buyer changes their mind, the seller gets to keep the option money. An option is typically, well, we really shouldn't say typically. With developers, usually in this area, it's a two-year contract. In other areas, it could be less, maybe more. There's a stated price in the option, whether it's an option to rent, uh, a tenant with an option to buy, or a developer looking to build something. So it's a contract with a delayed closing. Fixed period of time. the tenant looking to buy, or the developer looking to buy and build. Fixed period of time on the contract. And 
It's a unilateral contract. So if the builder decides not to go forward with the purchase, he doesn't have to. Seller can't make him buy. Seller gets to keep the option money. But if the builder wants to buy, the seller has to sell. Uni, uni meaning one. The statute of limitation says if I'm going to sue you for damages, I have to sue you within a time frame prescribed by law. If I wait too long, I forfeit that right. And every statute, or I should say every case, the time frame under statute of frauds is different. Civil actions must be commenced within time frames prescribed by law. Marketable title. Before, we said real estate contracts are bilateral. Bilateral promises are mutually exchanged. So the buyer promises to pay money to the seller, but the seller promises to give good title to the buyer. And what is good title? Well, it's free of liens, encumbrances, easements, restrictive covenants, encroachments, Etc. If when the survey is done, part of the house is on someone else's property, that's an encroachment. Title company won't insure it. What do you do? Take a chainsaw and cut off a couple feet of the house? In reality, that might have to be done. Restrictive covenants. A seller may put in restrictive covenants, which restrict some use. Okay, when we bought our property in upstate New York, the crazy lady we bought the property from, and I didn't name her that, all the other neighbors did, uh, she put in, there could never be mobile homes, trailers, campers, or temporary structure put on the property. Um, that's a restrictive covenant. We didn't care because we were building a house, but we've seen restrictive covenants restrict the use, and a buyer doesn't want to buy. When a restrictive covenant and a zoning ordinance cover the same property, the more restrictive covenant is upheld. So for instance, your town allows one acre zoning, but your development requires two acre zoning. The two acre zoning will be upheld. Easements. An easement is an encumbrance that affects the use of the property. It could be for a water line, a sewer line. It could be telephone poles. If it's in a far corner of the property, typically buyers are not all that phased with it. But what if it cuts right through the property? What if you have an underground uh, gas line or water line or sewer line cut right through the middle of the property? Could make the property useless. 
an easement affects the use of a property. Where a lien would affect title to the property. Federal requirements on one to four family properties built before 1978 Buyers and tenants must be given a 10-day window of opportunity to have a premises checked for lead paint. They don't have to, but they must be offered the opportunity. As real estate agents, we must give a pamphlet to buyers and tenants when dealing with one to four family property. The pamphlet is called Protect Your Family from Lead in the Home. The pamphlet not only covers lead paint, it could be a lead water pipe. In New Jersey, most of our schools are very old buildings. We didn't have copper back then. Many schools had lead pipes bringing water from the street into the building. And it took quite a while for the politicians to realize children were getting lead in their blood systems from drinking water flowing through lead pipes. Is it a contract or is it an agreement? In your real estate practice, you will hear, you will see a listing contract being referred to as a listing agreement. It is your job to tell buyers it's a contract because an agreement sounds too friendly. An agreement sounds like something you can rip up and throw in the garbage and it doesn't mean anything. No, it's a contract. When the seller signs a listing agreement, they are giving that broker exclusive marketing rights for that property for X amount of time. It's a contract. It's a contract. It's a bilateral contract. The broker agrees to put forth their best efforts to sell the property and the seller agrees to pay the broker for doing that. Same with a buyer broker contract. They call it an agreement. Again, it might say agreement on the top. It's a contract. And like any other contract, it's enforceable by law. When you start working for a broker, you will be an independent contractor and you will sign a broker independent contractor agreement. You'll agree to abide by the broker's policies and procedures. And again, that's a contract. 